before President and Mrs. Carter join us, uh, we're going to show a brief video about the Carter Center's work. So please start the video. <laughs> Built faces on earth, some full of hope and dreams, empty with despair, constrained by barriers that keep them from healthy and productive lives. The Carter Center works to tear down those barriers and create a world where everyone has a chance to live in peace and enjoy basic human rights. freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, freedom of religion and that sort of thing, but also the right of people to have a decent home in which to live, to have food to eat, to have a personal freedom to choose their own leaders, and also to be free from unnecessary disease and hunger. Well, I think the main thing the Carter Center does is bring hope to people. It doesn't matter where we go. The Carter Center has worked in over 70 countries to advance peace and fight devastating diseases. The center's staff of over 150 people work in many of the poorest regions of the world. After leaving the White House, the Carters had a strong desire to continue to make a difference in the world. And in partnership with Emory University in 1982, they founded the Carter Center. The Carter Center was created as a place where people could resolve conflicts like at Camp David. Over the years, the center has helped improve relations among nations and has opened the doors to peace. But it quickly grew to understand that peace is more than the absence of war. It is the building of strong democracies founded on human rights and justice for all. These are the seeds of permanent peace. Well, I think the main thing we've done is to promote the concept of freedom and democracy in countries that had never known what an election was. And this has been a transforming experience for many people. The center has observed over 76 elections in 30 countries, including Indonesia, Ethiopia, and Palestine. As a result, leaders are held accountable to the people in countries that have never had free and fair elections. Center is a leader in fighting neglected diseases. Diseases like guinea worm, river blindness, trachoma, and lymphatic filariasis. These are gone from the developed world, but they still afflict some of the poorest people on earth. The uh, promising thing is that these diseases are all preventable because we've proven that in the rich world. If the folks are just given a chance to know what they can do to improve their own lives, then they can transform their own lives into an opportunity for hope and self-respect and anticipation of a better future. <laughs> the eradication of guinea worm has been one of the major challenges of the Carter Center because this is such a horrible disease and is in such remote villages that no one else ever wanted to tackle it. And we're just on the verge of complete eradication of this disease from the face of the earth. And this will be the second disease in history ever completely eradicated. The transformation of a village population after one year of effort on their part, guided by us, is one of the most gratifying experiences of my life. The people of the Carter Center work for peace, fight disease, and most importantly, bring hope to those who never had it before. We are willing to take a chance that we might fail if we believe that the ultimate goal is worthwhile, worth our effort, and worth the investment in people who have been neglected by others. Okay. We were the poorest, most isolated people in the world. And I think often if we weren't there, there would be nobody to help them. These people who have been suffering in the past when we work among them, 
are with them, we find that they're just as intelligent, just as ambitious, just as hardworking, and their family values are just as good as mine. The Carter Center works where the need is greatest to improve the lives of the poor, the disadvantaged, and those who have no voice. The Center's accomplishments are a fitting tribute to its founders. There are literally hundreds of millions of people whose lives have been changed by what the Carter Center has done, plus many others who have benefited from the proof that we have provided to other agencies that they can do the same thing. Building hope is what we do at the Carter Center. Those are guinea worms, they're not snakes. 
And that was the only way you could treat guinea worms when we first started uh, working on them was to, uh, when the medical men and so forth would wrap the guinea worm around a stick to expedite its emergence from the human body. Ordinarily, it takes about 30 days, which is excruci excruciatingly painful. And if you wrap it around a stick and put some tension on it, you could get the guinea worm out in 20 days. So that was the only treatment for it. Well, the I'll just tell you, the first time I saw guinea worm, and that's, then I'll go on to the end to make my answer brief. Uh, the first time I saw guinea worm, Rose and I went to a little village in Ghana. It had about 300, it had about 500 total population, and 300 of the people had guinea worms coming out of their bodies. It was a horrible affliction that they had known for thousands of years. And uh, I noticed at the end of a of the open clearing, one beautiful young woman standing there, and I thought she was holding a baby in her arms, so I went over to ask her the name of the baby just to be polite. And when I got close to her, I found out that was her right breast she was holding in her arms. And it was about this long, and a guinea worm was coming out of the nipple of her breast. And I will never forget that moment. Later that year, 11 other guinea worms emerged from different parts of her body. That was our first experience with guinea worm in Ghana. Ghana, this past year, had its last case of guinea worm. They'll never have another one. And that is a case now with almost 20 of the countries in out of 21. The only place we found guinea worm this year is in southern Sudan. And although we started out with three and a half million cases, which the film may have shown you, uh, so far this year, in the first three years, we've only had 75 cases of guinea worms. So we've cut down more than 99.9%, .9 and we'll look forward to, to your next session in Atlanta, which I hope will be back here soon, to tell you about my last case of guinea worm that I've seen. So that's what's going on now with guinea worm, and that's the most exciting thing in our life as far as the Carter Center is concerned, is the approaching demise of the last guinea worm who will ever live Owner. <laughs> and this is Carter. What's new with you? Well, um, I've worked on mental health issues for 41 years, and then she was gone. And um, now I'm working really, really hard to try to get parity, the final implementation uh, regulations for parity. Parity was passed in 2002. And um, the temporary um, regulations were passed two years ago. It's been two years. They have never passed any final implementation regulations. And so what's happening now is that the um, uh, health management organizations are kind of making up their own rules, which is so bad. And I'm, I'm worried, and the no health community is worried that um, the parity bill that has already been passed is never going to be implemented as it should be. The White House says that, um, that they're going to include it in the Affordable uh, uh, Care Act, Health Care, Affordable Care Act. But now they're letting states make some of the rules about what will be done in their states. And so they're really worried about it. I did an op-ed piece with Patrick Kennedy just about a couple of weeks ago about it, and he and Jim Randstad, um, who I have worked with for years, Jim, Jim in the House and Patrick in the Senate. Um, well, now they have a press conference at, well, they, they spoke at the National Press Club, and now they have their uh, schedule to begin, I don't think they've forgotten yet, but begin, um, parity, we've developed a comparity coalition, they're going to have parity field hearings across the country. I looked to see if Atlanta was on the schedule, but it's not. But uh, to get people concerned, to try to get the implementation regulations passed now, and really worried about it. Parity called for um, employees, employers with 50 employees or more, to provide um, um, mental health care on, on the call with all other health care. Um, but then the Affordable Care Act, they tell us um, it's going to cover um, everything equally. Um, but as I said, now we worry about what states will do, and states can decide how to implement it. How then would you just 
define parity. Right? Obviously, people at the state level and at the federal level are looking at the same words. The legislation is the same, and yet if there are variations in how it's defined, it may lead to different consequences. If you were able to say, this is how I define parity, what would be the key elements? I would say everybody that, had, that needs help on an Affordable Care Act, if that's where it's going to be, no matter what kind of help they need, they should get it. But and Medicare, one, one thing about, see, in states, um, Medicaid pays for most of the health, um, mental health care for poor people. And um, the states determine what Medicaid is going to do. Well, then what are, you, what are you concerned about if somebody, if the, the state makes a definition and they say, oh, we're providing parity. Have you already seen or heard about interpretations that you don't think mean parity to you? Well, Florida, one of the um, health care management organizations, canceled all health coverage. They did away with that part of that. They said they're going to do another restart it, but we have no idea what it's going to do. What's going on? What it is. should be an exactly equal treatment for mental health problems and physical health problems under all federal laws. And that's already passed. That's already passed. So what do you, what well, do you the White think should be done? The White House just has, just has not followed up on it <laughs> because it might be politically controversial in an election year. It's one reason. Yeah. <laughs> and we've been waiting now for three or four years for them just to issue the directives to implement what's already been passed by the Congress, but they have not yet done so. We're trying to, to arouse the public to become interested in it and demand um, that it be, that it end up like it's a path, like it is, like it was passed. The coverage for everybody. Is it something that you would uh, advocate legal action? Is this something that they are not interpreting and not following the law as you see it? Well, we don't know what, the final, what is going to be in the Affordable Care Act. We don't know what's going to be in that. In terms of the enabling of the regulations? Right after the speech that the press run Somebody, when they do priorities, 
Mexico is the priority. Uh, Perry is always the priority for the implementation regulations, and it doesn't end up on the list. It's just really frustrating. Yeah, so I, I, you're in a very elite club here. Of, of You've been in the White House. Now, remember, can't you call up President Obama and say, hey, one president to another, what's going on? I don't know how many times I've called the White House. I don't know. So are they not? I mean, really, what's the reaction? I mean, you're the partners. <laughs> they don't take your calls? They, they, they take the lunch calls. <laughs> So is it that they're giving you a very nice answer, being very pleasant, and then you go away and you don't see any action? So does that indicate that once you leave the room, they're saying, oh well, and, and making just a political calculation? Well, I'm not the only one that's, uh, that's uh, been after them about it, but for some reason they won't get involved with the Affordable Care Act, and I'm just I'm not done it. And what's going on at the you state? Know, we really, really hard to get that paradigm passed. Four years ago. What do you think is really at the heart of opposition to parity? Insurance companies. Health care. Management organizations that we call them. Health care. And do you think that, that I mean, right now insurance companies aren't the most popular uh, entities in our country? So if it's a political calculation, they're not the most popular, but they're the most powerful. You know, when it comes to health care, the insurance companies are extremely popular. As you know, the lobbyists and so forth. And then, as I said three or four times, this is an election year. And uh, to lose votes is not popular for your side. And it's a controversial issue. Mental health has always been controversial. And that's what Rosa's devoted 40 years to trying to remove the stigma from mental health problems so that people will go on an equal basis in their minds and get treated and also so that church companies know to treat them fairly. But they don't. And that's been a major commitment of Rosa. She, in fact, if you give her any list of things to talk about, she's going to talk about mental health and parity, number one. Which is We've true. seen that, yeah. <laughs> when Jim was president, I had meetings, my first meetings with the professor commission, the press came. And after that, nobody would show up. One day I was walking through the um, downstairs corridor at the White House and met this woman reporter. And I, I was asking her, why are you not coming to my press situation on mental health hearings? And she said, well, Mrs. Carter, you have to recognize that mental health is not a sexy issue. What is it still after all these years about mental health when you look at the numbers and you know that everybody either has somebody in their, their close family, it either affects them, somebody in their family, somebody they know. Even though it, it seems hidden, I mean, we, we all have personal experience with it, why is it still? I don't understand it. It's the fear factor. What we've learned is that um, um, the more people learn, when there's a poll done by Columbia University, I worked at Columbia a lot, and Indiana, and Indiana University, own stigma. And what we learned was that with depression and, and um, uh, anxiety disorders, the stigma's going down a little bit. But with the, the um, um, disorders, the, the serious disorders, the, um, like schizophrenia, bipolar, the more people learn about them, the more um, skeptical or afraid they become. Because they don't like to know that something's wrong with the brain, and it's the, it's the fear factor. And um, we're trying to learn as much. I worked on stigma for 41 years, and one of the programs at the Carter Center is um, one of our main objects is to work on stigma. And we have um, no health journalism fellowships. I think um, I know that uh, I know that I've been told that there's been many of my journalism fellows in this audience today. 
and and we let them know the facts about mental illness and how to report act, accurately instead of sensationally like in the past so much and still some today, but it's gotten better. But um, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to go kind of state when I don't know. I just I tried everything. I have been told that the best way to overcome the stigma is to learn that, um, and that person you talk to across the back <coughs> fence, if anybody still does that, is somebody you know, and you see them, if it's a woman raising a family, a man going to work, uh, and you're not afraid of them, and you learn they're living with bipolar and schizophrenia, then, then you realize that, um, that you don't have to be afraid. But how are we gonna do that? We work on it all the time at Congress and I'm trying to find different ways to overcome. And fel the mental health fellowship is the best way we've ever had. Everybody, what, what is, everybody what have you seen that. from that program? What is it that, that you try, you know, why involve journalists? Why do you think it's important to involve journalists? In well, I had one journalism fellow from Oregon that worked for the Oregon, and this was a good while ago. Um, the year before, he had his fellowship. There were six articles in the news about um, um, mental health issues, mostly negative. The year he was a fellow, there were 66 articles, mainly positive. I mean, that makes a difference if you write a story about um, a person who is living with bipolar and is an executive of a co company, uh, the head of a radio station, it makes a lot of difference with people. We just need a lot more. I've got more questions here on, on mental health, but I, I, I don't want to uh, <laughs> rob your husband of, of, of any uh, attention here. So I'm, I'm going to just jump right back into uh, things like anywhere. As you say, it's, it's an affliction that's been around for millennia. Uh, it, it's something that uh, medical science, and, and, as you say, had very crude tools to attempt to deal with in the old days, but then there were new tools to develop. What, tell me about how you decided to become involved in it, and, and what were the elements that made you believe that this moment in time was the moment when you could actually change something that had been unchanged for all those millennia? Well, when the Corner Center was founded 30 years ago, approximately, we decided to take all the projects that other people didn't want to do. In other words, to build vacuums in the world. If uh, the United Nations or the United States government or Harvard University or the World Health Organization was taking care of a problem, we didn't want to get involved in it. We just took things that nobody else wanted to address because of the difficulty of the remoteness and so forth. And anywhere, was one of the most uh, difficult challenges that the world ever faced in healthcare because it only exists in isolated <coughs> villages, either in the desert or in the jungle. Uh, there's no access to fresh water except a rain pond that fills up maybe three months a year, and then you drink water out of the pond for the rest of the nine months. And that's where the guinea worm eggs developed. So we found this, uh, we, we did a search the world after I adopted this uh, project uh, to fill a vacuum, and we found the we have found this disease in 26,500 villages in 20 different countries in Asia and Africa, and we found three and a half million cases. So we decided to eradicate it, and we learned how to do it. And we luckily have Centers for Disease Control right next door to us. So when a scientist in CDC gets completely infatuated with the disease, but he wants to concentrate, concentrate on it full time, we steal that scientists from the CDC <laughs> and put him in charge of the program. So we've had very good luck there. But now we've decided not only on uh, guinea worm, which is on the verge of being eradicated, but we have five other diseases in which the Carter Center is involved. And we don't, uh, and four of them are relatively unknown in, in, a, in the United States. Schistosomiasis, lymphatic polarisis, onchocerciasis, and trachoma. We also deal with malaria which is known in the United States, but no longer exists here. So the, the reason we took on these cases was because neither, such, neither the Centers for Disease Control nor WHO were making any progress against them. So we decided to undertake that. Well, the Carter Center now has programs in about 73 countries in the world. More than, about half of them are in Africa. 
where most of these diseases take place. And these uh, illnesses that are no longer known in the developed world, uh, even in, say, South America, are prevalent in Africa and, and afflict hundreds of millions of people. And what grieves me is that we've already proven that the diseases don't, don't need to exist. The people just don't know how to address them and nobody has cared for them. So that's what we do. Last year, for instance, we treated 11,500,000 people for river blindness or onchocerciasis with a free medicine that Merkin Company gives us. We, we've distributed over 150 million doses of, of this medicine called Mectisan, and we have to go into the village and actually put it into the people's mouths. You can't send it into a village because people that have rubber blindness are not only going blind, but they have horrendous itching all over their body, worse than poison ivy. And so if a woman or a man, either one, uh, has a choice of either this one little pill that will ease their problem and prevent blindness, or a diamond of the same age, same size, they'd rather have the pill if they couldn't get the pill. And so we can't just send the medicine in, we have to actually go in and put it in people's mouth. So that's what we do. And uh, trachoma, for instance, is the number one cause of preventable blindness on Earth. And it afflicts people because eyes get filthy and, and they get infected and the upper eyelid turns inward. So every time a person blinks, the eyelashes slice the cornea and that causes trachoma, blindness. So those are the kind of diseases that we, that we treat. And, it's, and, and we have to be the, the one who goes into the depths of the jungle or into the distant areas of the desert, like in Mali and Burkina Faso and Niger, uh, and, and actually deliver the medicine and teach the people how to do their own work. Obviously, the, these things, the, the medicine, the science that exists is the same. It, as you say, the knowledge is there. The difference in terms of why it doesn't exist in one place or is easily dealt with in one place, and yet it becomes an endemic problem in another place, Clearly, it's, the variable is not medical science. The variable is something else. What, t tell me about the, the, how you learn what to do in order to effectively manage and eradicate these problems in areas where so many people just said, oh, you know, that's just too difficult. We can't do that. We don't know how. What, what are the right steps, and how did you learn about well, them? We're intimately involved with the Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, also with the World Health Organization and with CDC, because the Carter Center has bubbled up to the top of the organizations that actually go and deliver the care and teach people how to do it themselves. So we have been able to accumulate the foremost experts, the, the medical scientists, who, uh, who know about these diseases. They come and work for us. And we also get a lot of information from CDC and, and WHO still. So they tell us what the disease is, and I am an eager student, so is Rosen. So we learn all about this disease is enough to go in. But quite often, uh, we go into a country, and, and since I've been president of the United States, before I get to the country, I can send word to the president of that country. The former president of the United States wants to visit your nation, and he'll say, oh, I want to have a state banquet for you. I said, no, what I want to do is I want to meet with you and your, and your prime minister and your minister of health, and, and education and, and agriculture and, and, and finance. So I meet with the whole cabinet and we sign a contract between that country and the Carter Center that we will come in and eradicate or control this particular disease. So I start from the very top level, from the king or, or president, and then we go out into the villages themselves. And we don't bypass the local you know, medical cabinet officers as well. So we get to know the country intimately from the capital all the way out to the most remote uh, villages. And that's what the Carter Center does. And so we, right now, we're, we have the only cases of guinea worms left on Earth. Uh, we have found 75 cases so far this year, uh, all in southern Sudan. At this point, at this moment, we have about 8,200 volunteers that we have trained in southern Sudan, and we have about 112 employees, most of whom are southern Sudanese, that are working on this disease, along with our few scientists that we send in from outside. We send in very few foreigners. What we do is go into the country and train those people how to deal with the problem. We don't send any money to the government. We, we go in and work with the people and teach them what to do. We teach the health officials. We go into the villages and the health officials in the villages. And, um, and, and it's not hard to find a cure at some things like anywhere. 
no medication. You just have to teach them to strain the water so they won't get the egg. And uh, trachoma is um, building up through trees, which keeps the fly fast, the number of flies down. Um, and um, Jimmy said he's built, we, we have over 500,000 latrines built in an area in Ethiopia um, to prevent, to help prevent trachoma. I'm I'm much more famous for that than I am bringing peace between the Israel and Israel. I have two buttons. One was for the 150 million um, doses of Mexican, and one is, and when got these at the last director's meeting. And the other one is for distributing 10 million bed nets to prevent real life. Malaria and lymphatic filariasis, which has come from the same mosquito. A lot of the health coverage, so called, uh, in, in this country and in and a lot of developed countries, involves uh, uh, doctors in white coats and hospitals and clinics. And yet, what you're describing here about and both mental health and, and dealing with, with uh, some of the, the diseases you picked out, you identified a political process. Right. How you get to the leaders, then how you get to the people on the local level. That certainly there's there's science and medicine involved, but that the real job is political, social, economic. Is that what you're finding? Well, and the key is journalists in those countries. You know, if the people in this audience, or, or me, 40 years ago, I had never heard of trachoma or lymphatic filariasis or schistosomiasis or onchocerciasis. I had never heard of any of those. But when we go into the country and start to eradicate a disease, for them it's life or death. And, and we don't put our name on things. We let the local people get credit for it. We call it Global 2000. So when a, a president of a country sees that he no longer has, or she no longer has, uh, trachoma in the, into our country, they can say, my trachoma program, my 2000 Global 2000 program, got rid of trachoma, got rid of getting one. And, and the same thing with the local village uh, leaders. They can say, our Global 2000 program eliminated this disease. We don't put our name on things. But the fact is that you have to get cooperation from the top leaders without uh, taking credit for it. You have to give them credit for anything that's accomplished in their own people's villages. And, and that's a key to success. Yeah, and, we, and they do the work. They do the work, and it makes so much difference. If people in the village have strained everything and they get rid of guinea worms, um, it's probably the first time they have ever seen anything successful done in their lives. And you go to those villages, it's just a celebration. It's really a promotion. Tell me about it. When was the last celebration you went to? <coughs> guinea worm, I don't know. How long have we been? We went to Sudan. We were in the Sudan for the election, okay? And uh, with a, I didn't go on that trip. Jimmy went way Well, just tell me about a, a, good, a, a favorite time when you went to a celebration. Where was it? What do you remember? You, you saw their pictures with us with the, you know, with the uh, costumes. Oh. Well, they, they've given us uh, prime goats, and they've given me grazing rights. They've given me land. They <laughs> <laughs> wanted to come back and put our home there. And, uh, they made my chief at one village and put a outfit on him and then he had to dance around him. He <laughs> 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 had to dance around the crowd. <laughs> well, tell me, if, if he ever doesn't do something you want him to do, does he say, hey, I'm, I'm the village chief, I don't have to do That happens so far. <laughs> but you can't imagine the uh, depth of uh, gratitude that these people have to have been, say, two years ago, afflicted with that's like that little bit that I mentioned to you, 300 people out of 500 at Guineaworth. But if, it, if they all do the right thing, then in one year, that disease is eliminated. So we went back a year later, they had zero Guineaworth. And that village will never have another case of Guineaworth. And neither will Ghana, or neither will Burkina Faso, or neither will other countries that we have been in. So that's, that, and they remember this, obviously, the older ones. But of course, the younger ones will never even have heard of Guineaworth. One of my most exciting um, 
visits, and I can't tell this whole story because Jimmy heard me tell it so much. <laughs> but we had a was the beginning of the train in Tacoma Convention in Ethiopia. And the, with this man who worked with us, uh, we have the best people. Um, this one, and in Georgia, this came from the tropical disease and in London. Not only from the Centers for Disease Control. But he went in and showed, showed them how to dig one of the tree. And um, the woman got so excited. We learned that in that area, the whole area, women could not go to the bathroom in the daytime. And I had to go see that woman. So we went to her village. And um, she got, she's the one that got so excited and got the women, other women in the village. But we just went in and showed them how to do it. And then, of course, we have people that go in and visit them sometimes, but they don't go out, the, the dreams. If they had to pay somebody, it costs about two dollars, I think. Um, I'm about to dig the latrine. But, um, but that's the one. I went, we went to say, and we looked in the latrine. It, um, they had put sticks over it with palm farms and leaves. And I was looking in, and it had, they had these big gourds, and they had cut the top out of the gourd, tied a vine to it, and tied it. That was the lid. <laughs> and um, she was standing, there was a television camera with us because sometimes the, the city, the capital city will send somebody with us. And um, there was a television um, camera behind and she was telling this man, and now I can believe myself anytime I want to. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was great. It's always so exciting. I get tired of going to Africa, but we I thought say, we might. next time I will, but next time I'm right there. We thought we might do it. Two or three thousand latrines that first year in Ethiopia. We did fifty nine thousand latrines that first year. Eighty nine thousand. Now we've passed five hundred thousand. That's, so we'll, that, that's one of the things we can brag about. Is how we <laughs> well, now you talk about uh, the successes you've had and how to work with people in those areas where they need it. Not all eradication programs seem to be sharing all that success. Uh, you know, polio eradication, is the, the end game has been very frustrating, in part because there's been local opposition. There are fears, there's myths, there's political backlash. What's the difference? How is it that, the, what is it that you're succeeding in that perhaps the polio eradication is having trouble with? And would you have advice for them? No, well, we work very closely with the polio folks, and we're very proud of what they've done, and they've done a good job. But there was one area in northern uh, Nigeria, uh, that's basically an Islamic area, and the word got out that uh, this was a foreign uh, plan to prevent the birth of, of young, uh, the life of young people who lived in Nigeria, that this was somehow poison. And it was a false report, which has since been corrected even in Nigeria. But that word spread. And uh, that's how polio kind of got its new life. But there are two kinds of polio vaccine, as you know. One is the salt vaccine, the other one is the Sabine vaccine. And the Sabine vaccine is very simple. You just put three drops on a baby's tongue, a young people's tongue. But there are three kinds of uh, polio. This is kind of complicated. And, and some of the vaccines of the number two kind, the three kinds, cause polio to happen. In one case, in about two million. But when you when you immunize, you know, several hundred million people, you, you have maybe 50 or 60 or 70 that, that get polio. So that's what they're dealing with now. In, in the latest uh, edition of Scientific American, there's a complete bit of complete report on this. If you really are interested in it, but but that's what's happened. It's not a matter of uh, of not dealing with people properly, which we try to do, or that the polio folks did not treat. Properly, they were just afflicted with bad luck. And also, I think one thing we do is we let the people do the work, and that's that's one thing. Um, that, that's a little bit different. And we learn from each other. We cooperate with the polio folks. They cooperate with us. Yeah. And, and how much, obviously, the, you see the patterns, and you see that where there's social disruption, where institutions don't work, that's where you see disease. Well, that's the problem. Say, that's why we still have. Uh, anywhere in South Sudan is because Sudan and South Sudan have been at war for 30 years. You've been over there. And so we went over, and I went over in 1995, we couldn't get into Southern Sudan at all. Because, and we knew they had a lot of Guinea work, not how much. So we finally negotiated a peace agreement between Northern and South Sudan after 25 years of uninterrupted war. 
just for 30, just for 60, six months. So we can go into Southern Sudan and, and, and analyze the guinea worm problem. And we found a lot of guinea worm there. And then the war started again. And, and we couldn't get in and, and give them our bed nets to, to strain the water through, uh, nets to strain the water through. But, but the, the uh, Tuaregs in the northern part of the Sahara Desert developed a system where they tied one of our little screens on the end of a, rock, of a reed, and they would take it around on that nest because they, they were nomads. And they would use that little reed with a net around the bottom to suck water through and take out the guinea worm eggs. So we found out about it, and the Norwegians made nine million of those, of those strainers, filter tubes, and we, and we put, sent them into southern Sudan, although we couldn't go in. So by the time we finally got into southern Sudan, they had cut down guinea worm a lot. So we have to work with you know, scientific elements and also with a lot of other people in cooperate. And, and also another thing is the last stages of something like polio or like um, guinea worm are difficult. If it's not all gone, it's because of the, uh, some, something in the village like the chief been approved or in Sudan and we had um, people attacking our, overrunning our offices and, and uh, destroying everything and, and because of the war. Um, so, the last stages, and also you have to monitor every country. It takes three years. You have to be the country has to be without the, the, the illness three years before the World Health Organization would account uh, it um, free of, of uh, what they call it. it. It's not eradicated. It's eliminated before they were declared eliminated. And so you have to monitor it closely. In, I think it was Ethiopia when this man came in after the storm to meet him with the water to and somebody came in and went down the river and stopped him alone and gave get the worms to different people after we gone from that area. And then also recently in Chad, which has been gone for 10 years and a few cases. So you have to have monitors everywhere. It's really expensive for like the agents of the disease. Another parallel, I think, between some of what we've been talking about in mental health and, and some of these physical health problems in, in the developing world have to do with who cares, who's paying attention, and telling the stories. We're all journalists here. We're, we're storytellers. And when we go into our, our editors and bosses and say, hey, I've got this story, and then you, you run into on a mental health story or on a story about a guinea worm or something else that's happening far away from the circulation area of that paper or, 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 or coverage area of that TV station, there's like, well, why should why should our audience care? Why should they care? But, you know, I, I think the average American person reacts positively to a success story, particularly in Africa. And for instance, Nicholas, Nicholas Christoph from the New York Times has been with us to the most remote areas of Ethiopia and sometimes in southern Sudan. And he writes articles in the New York Times, which carries around. But, but I think any single journalist, uh, any of, of them here, can write a favorable story about, about our success or all the success in, in getting rid of a disease, even in a foreign country, and it comes home to the readers in Atlanta or in St. Louis or in Los Angeles or wherever. So I think, I think that's one thing that can appeal to people is, is the plight of people who suffer and then Later, they don't suffer anymore because of uh, assistance to them, but also because of their own initiative and their own capabilities and dedication. And yet, uh, in mental health, you're saying that you just keep running into the same stigma issues, the same unwillingness to, to open it up, the, the, and resistance to discussing it that you've seen for four decades. So, how how do journalists get through that? This is your I think that <laughs> <laughs> just writing stories about what's happening and what, if there's something sensational that happens, you know, like shooting at somebody in the capital in Washington, once I think, and it's really good to go back and see that almost without exception, it was somebody who did not get the mental health care he or she needed. Almost without exception. Um, and you have to remember that Walter Cronkite's daughter suffered from depression. Mike Wallace, who just died. Suffers from depression. Abraham Lincoln suffered from depression, and one of their most journalists wrote a whole book about Abraham Lincoln suffering from depression. 
and, and the fact that, that famous and, and successful people do suffer from mental illness and, and succeed is a very good story always. And, and, and there would be people in every community represented here of, of a chief executive officer of a major corporation who has suffered from depression. And increasingly, those top leaders are willing to speak out primarily because of those and by encouraging them to do so and how they can be very beneficial to other people by just by speaking out. But also, today, because of what we know about the brain now, people recover, even from, people can recover, even from serious mental illness. And everybody doesn't know that. I think if people learn um, that, that you can recover, um, they would be more willing to, to get help. Recovery is possible. There will always be a few that can't recover, but I have known so many people with schizophrenia, bipolar, and who are doing businesses, doing leading normal life, raising families, and those kinds of stories need to be out there so people will know and can go and get help. People don't go to get help because of the stigma. And some women got together with the stigma. And I think if, if um, People, well, I dream that I'm so proud of. Um, most of them have kept on writing stories, got involved in mental health and issues, and are still writing stories. They're influencing people in the newsrooms. Uh, and um, I think the more that we learn and hear about, or write stories about um, people who are in big positions or um, raising families and going to work every day, um, those kinds of things, we're, we're now working toward um, mental health um, treatment is changing. But we used to, when somebody went to a doctor and and I was diagnosed with a mental illness, all hope was gone because nobody, I didn't think anybody could, could recover. Nobody thought anybody could recover back when I, well, even when we had the Crisis Commission on Mental Health. And, um, but now if people, knew that and knew that they could look forward to it, it would be, they would be more likely to come for help. If they could see people, and another thing, it's more moving to it's moving to a recovery, but it's also moving to a um, um, integration that come with private care, okay, private um, doctors and mental health um, um, community working together like a community center where you can get any kind of treatment that you need. And if they had them in the communities, and people could see those with mental illnesses going in just when they have an episode in need help, and other times living in the community, raising the children, going to work, I think that would do more to overcome stigma than anything, but we got to get that out there and, and, and get people who would feel that. Yeah. Now, and during the, the years, President Carter, when, when you were governor and then and then president, back in those decades was a, the time of transition from predominantly institutionalized care to one who over the cuckoo's nest days to working towards community-based uh, management and, and treatment of mental health. There are a lot of people who say that that didn't end up so doing so well because those people got pushed out of institutions and ended up on the streets. As a matter of fact, the first movie we saw in the White House was one film for two. For historical memory, thank you. Congratulations on that. And we, I had a meeting earlier today with uh, German class, German class at Emory, both of course are now professors at Emory University, and uh, Jack Nelson was mentioned, who got the Pulitzer Prize. He was a LA Times representative in uh, in Washington and, and won the Pulitzer Prize here for his revelation of the abuses of mental health patients within the great institutions like in Georgia. We had 12,000 patients crammed in there for a lifetime and treated like animals. And it was that, that revelation that finally opened up uh, the mental health opportunities for people to go into the community centers. There's still a lot of need, but at least uh, Rosen and her cohorts I included both former Senator Ted Kennedy and, and his son and others have really done a lot to open up the uh, opportunity for people to know about mental health. So it's, it's changing slowly. I think, I think stigma is being removed a lot more rapidly 
and Rosen will acknowledge because it's still a, a, an uncompleted task. But there's a lot of a lot of knowledge now that hasn't been forthcoming at the time. But how, how about the specific criticism that closing down a lot of state mental institutions were just shut and people were moved out. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the safety net wasn't there to pick them up. In the no, but they, it, it's better to have some, some I think, homeless than to have 12,000 in a place where it should be 3,000. So they had nothing to They didn't wear clothes. <coughs> I mean, it was awful. And that was what happened. Um, our, uh, the, the big uh, um, expose of our Central State Hospital by Jack Nelson. Um, just in 1958 or something, Jimmy was running for government in 1966, and I was campaigning. Community the Mental Health Service Act had been passed, but no service had been built yet in our state. But they were turning people out. But no, but that's when I got involved because people were asking me every day I was campaigning. Well, my husband would be for that love for it. That's what state. What Georgia has is on the way to heaven. It could no help problem, and it's because of Andy Miller, who is here, I saw him earlier, and his cohort, who um, did a big post, uh, expose on our mental health hospitals, and 137 people died um, unnecessarily, things that could have gotten over. And um, we had the court, with the court, we said saving, um, was uh, two suits against it. And we got a good settlement, and now uh, Georgia is. And while the settlement was going on, the Court of Civil Health Program decided we worked with the with the um, advocates and they on that settlement. We decided to, to develop a a vision of a really good mental health program that we developed. It. And now, um, and we and the state began working with us. We were working with them with some of the advocates and started working with them. State, and we're trying to get the settlement, and um, and now we have hearings across the country. The settlement came down, requiring um, community services for those who needed it. And when we got an increase in our budget, which nobody else in the country did, I think. But we, but there's hope now for other states to have a better system because of the settlement we got. Because they all under at least one of those suits about a law that was passed many years ago that's never been implemented. We have just a few minutes left. I've got a, a list of questions that were submitted by our members, and I'm, I'm afraid uh, we've had so much fun talking, we're not going to get to all of them, but, but several of them get to one of the key policy questions facing the nation right now. What is the Supreme Court, and what is Congress, and what might the next president, whether that is, do about the Affordable Care Act and next steps, if there are any, in health care reform? What's your view of the things happening right now in this country about our system of financing and delivering health care? Well, I think the most important single fact to remember is that we have 31 million people in America that don't have uh, health insurance coverage. And uh, that applies to some of our children uh, as well. And it's a devastating thing for any family to be faced with a ma major illness, mental or physical illness without any money to pay for care. And so this is, uh, I think, the major reason that I and, and other presidents since, since me, and even before me, have tried to get something into uh, health care. And I'm very glad that President Obama made that attempt, although I was very disappointed at the outcome of the legislation. It's still a, a big improvement in the future. If, uh, if Obama is reelected, uh, then obviously the federal government will continue to try to implement it. And if uh, and if the Supreme Court should rule otherwise, then I think we'll have to go back to scratch and see what we can do. But the United States spends much more than any other country on health care, and ours is much inferior in general terms to that in Canada or Great Britain or France or other European countries. So we have a long way to go in health care, and I don't know yet know what's going to happen. Knowing what the Supreme Court, this particular Supreme Court has done in previous rulings, uh, I don't have much confidence that they'll make the right judgment. What, what, what do you think would happen politically if either the Supreme Court nullifies the entire law or for whatever reason there's a change in the White House and Congress and they vote to eliminate the law? 
I don't know about politically, but I mean, I, I think the more uh, pertinent question is what will happen to the people that don't have health coverage. And they will suffer. So we'll have a lot of millions of people in our country that will suffer because of that adverse decision that's made either by the next president of Congress or by the Supreme Court. And yet there seem to be a polls and other things say there's a lot of opposition to the law. I know. What's going on? I don't know what's going on. I'm not in charge anymore. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think there's been a lot of, uh, I would say, propaganda that's been put out about, uh, you know, about death knell for old people and, and things of that kind. And Rose and I uh, come into that category, by the way. We assume have been married 66 years, and we still trying to get along with each other. <laughs> 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 Tea Party group and, and some of the Republican candidates have all uh, been very successful through Fox television and others, talk some, some radio talk shows that I won't mention uh, uh, in a public crowd, um, <laughs> that they've uh, misled the American people. Because I think if, if the facts were known, uh, then I believe the American people would say we need to do something to improve our health system, and I think comprehensive coverage is better. I would personally have preferred uh, what they call a single pay plan, which would have been, have been much simpler. And that's what uh, President Obama promised during his campaign, but later under political pressures, which I understand he had to change his position. But that would have meant just, just taking what Medicare does now and expanding it step by step to include all age groups and not just apply to old people. So Medicare, if expanded, could have been a very simple uh, and comprehensive program. Well, we're just one more question here that came from the list uh, submitted by our, our members, and it was a perfect segue from something you just said there about not being in the White House anymore. Um, will you run again? <laughs> no, I think there's an age limit. <laughs> well, thank you again very much, President Carter and Mrs. Carter. We